Um, welcome to the Watson Institute. I'm Eric Potashnik, the director of Watson's Master of Public Affairs program and professor of political science and public policy. It's a pleasure to moderate uh, today's panel on the bias within, false beliefs about bodies and minds. In a moment, I'll introduce our three panelists, but let me first say a couple of words to frame our conversation. One of the most exciting developments over the past few decades is the progress that's been made in using insights into human behavior from psychology and behavioral science to shape the design of public policy for the betterment of society. All of us have intuitions about how people behave, but it turns out our intuition is sometimes wrong. As Princeton's Elder Shafair has argued, policies based on a naive understanding of what motivates people or how people make life decisions, such as how much to save for retirement, are less likely to succeed and may even backfire. Research into the drivers of human behavior, including cognition, judgment, emotional reactions, and the desire of people to follow social norms is informing responsive to challenges ranging from poverty and discrimination to healthcare and the environment. One of the lessons from this research is that decision making is highly situation specific, and that even minor contextual features can sometimes have a larger influence on what people do than their professed beliefs. A second lesson is that people respond not simply to objective experience, but rather to their mental representations of the world, which may or may not bear close correspondence with actual circumstances. The third lesson, and the jumping off point for today's conversation, is that people lack direct access to the thoughts, feelings, or beliefs of others. Informal interactions between friends and family members as well as more formal interactions between people in institutionalized settings like the workplace depend upon guesses and hunches, uh, and hunches about what others think, feel, and believe. These mental state inferences can have major consequences for decision making and policy relevant contexts such as the healthcare and legal systems. To explore these consequences and the broader topic of the contribution of psychology to public policy, we've assembled a distinguished panel. So let me introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, first, Sophie Trawalter the, is an associate professor of public policy and psychology uh, at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. I should say Sophie was a former uh, colleague of mine at Virginia, and it's great to see her and Ben again. Uh, she studies psychological processes that contribute to social disparities. Prior to joining UVA, she was a postdoc at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern and received her PhD in psychological and brain sciences from Dartmouth. Next, Ben Converse is an assistant professor of public policy and psychology at the Batten School and Department of Psychology at UVA. Using the tools of social psychology and judgment and decision making, he investigates basic psychological processes that have critical implications for management, leadership, and policy. He received his PhD uh, in managerial and organizational behavior from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And uh, finally, our discussant, uh, from Brown, Joachim Kruger is Professor of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Sciences. He came to Brown in 1991 after attending graduate school at the University of Oregon and his postdoc years at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. His research covers a variety of topics in social judgment and decision making, such as self-perception, strategic interpersonal behavior, and intergroup relations. He is intrigued by the intersections of cognitive social psychology with behavioral economics and organizational behavior. It's a real pleasure to have all three of you here, uh, especially on a Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful day, but this is such an exciting topic that I'm looking forward to uh, your presentation. So, Sophie. Thank you. All right. And let's see. Is this my? Yeah. Is this working? Beautiful. Good afternoon. Can you hear me if I don't use the mic? Perfect. Okay. So in 1966, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. addressed the, oh, it's on my screen here, the Medical Committee for Human Rights. And he famously stated, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Shocking and inhumane, I think, uh, because healthcare can make the difference between life and death, because the goal of healthcare is to reduce pain and suffering. And so to condone healthcare disparities is to condone the pain and suffering of black and brown people. Uh, and in fact, uh, racial disparities in healthcare in the US have persisted. Uh, in its most recent report, the US Department of Health and Human Services uh, reports that blacks and Hispanics receive worse care 
on about 40% of quality measures that they measure. These quality measures include receipt of services needed to prevent or treat a medical condition and the outcomes of those uh, treatments, including mortality. These healthcare disparities uh, in healthcare are, are prevalent across many domains. Uh, I think they're particularly striking in pain management. Uh, so we have a lot of evidence at this point and lots of reviews uh, suggesting that black patients are systematically undertreated for pain relative to their white counterparts. So let me just give you just a few studies that I think demonstrate the scope uh, and, and extent of this. So this is a study uh, looking at limb fractures, and what they find here is that whites are significantly more likely to get higher doses of morphine relative to black and Hispanic patients. Here is another study looking at long bone fractures, and again you see here that in this case whites are getting a significantly larger proportion of white patients are getting um, analgesics here compared to blacks. And this is not restricted to fractures. Uh, we know, for example, in cancer pain that this is also true, that whites are much more likely to get pain meds. I think this is a particularly interesting context because here the World Health Organization has very clear guidelines about pain management. And so Cleland and colleagues here argue that here this is a case where minorities are uh, not only significantly less treated, but disproportionately undertreated. Okay, so I'm a psychologist. So from a social psychological perspective, what might influence uh, these pain disparities uh, or these uh, disparities in healthcare? Broadly speaking, I think we see two possibilities. The first is that perhaps black, pa black patients' pain is recognized but not treated. And certainly some have argued that this happens. Uh, there's some research suggesting that physicians have negative stereotypes about black patients. For example, stereotypes that they can't afford meds, uh, that they will abuse meds or sell them. We have focused on another uh, interpretation, and I should know that these are not necessarily much mutually exclusive, uh, but we've thought a bit about whether par black patients' pain is perhaps not recognized in the first place and thus can't be treated. And our lab and other labs have found uh, certainly that lay people uh, assume that black people feel less pain than do um, white people. Uh, so the question is, do medical practitioners also do this? I think we have some initial evidence that they do. So let me show you two studies to suggest that medical doctors tend to uh, under, underestimate black patients' pain. This was a seminal study by Staten and colleagues. And what they did here is they asked um, patients in 12 uh, medical centers about their pain. And they asked them to rate their pain on a 10-point or 11-point scale from zero, no pain, to 10, excruciating pain. Uh, they ask the physicians the same thing about their patient's pain. And what they find is about 43% of the time, doctors underestimate their patient's pain by at least two points on that scale, and that they're disproportionately likely to do so for black patients. So what they find is that nearly 50% of the time, doctors are underestimating their black patient's pain. Okay. Uh, in another study that Jamie Druckmann uh, and I uh, conducted together with some of his students, uh, we looked at NCAA Division I sport medical staff. And here the study, again, I think was quite simple um, and straightforward. We have uh, medical staff uh, folks from uh, NCAA Division I uh, schools, and they read a case about a student athlete who had torn their ACL. So this is apparently one of the most common uh, injuries uh, in sports in college. And then they answered a number of questions about that case. Uh, importantly, they, asked, they answered the question, how painful do you think the injury was? They also answered questions about their racial attitudes. So this is the vignette that they saw. And so they saw that a student uh, in a, a sport had um, torn their ACL. And participants were either randomly assigned to read that this athlete, this student athlete, had a stereotypically black name or a stereotypically white name. They also uh, were assigned to read uh, that this student was either in basketball, a stereotypically black sport, or soccer, a stereotypically white sport. And again, the question is, how much pain does this, does this student feel as a result of this, of this injury? And what we find uh, is that participants give, gave a lower pain rating uh, if they read about a student in basketball versus soccer. They also, importantly for this talk, gave lower pain ratings uh, to the student, to the black student athlete relative to the white student athlete. So what's interesting here, too, uh, to note is that participants' racial attitudes didn't matter. Right, so they didn't moderate this fact. They didn't predict whether or not uh, people made this bias. And so in the rest of my talk today, I want to address two, I think, important follow-up questions. Uh, the first is, 
what beliefs do predict racial bias and perceptions of others' pain? Um, I think in my lab we've identified a couple. Today I'll talk about beliefs of black, white biological differences. And then also think about at what cost. Right? So one of the arguments that we've made is that perhaps this bias might contribute to disparities in pain management. And so here we want to see if actually these pain ratings track with pain recommendations. Okay. Um, all right. So historically, we know that the United States has a long history of thinking about race in biological terms. Uh, we know that in the, the 19th century, physicians, um, physicians and scientists used nascent theories of evolution to make the case that the Negro was closer to apes uh, and that white men and Europeans in particular were closer to an evolved state. Uh, we know that that led to a lot of documentation of biological differences between blacks and whites. Uh, and that these differences were sort of championed by scientists, physicians, uh, and slave owners to justify slavery and the harsh treatments of slaves. So let me just give you um, just some examples of writings uh, suggesting that this was a thing. Right? So here this is by Dr. Benjamin Mosley uh, in the Treatise Upon Tropical Disease where he writes, they bear surgical operations much better than white people uh, and what would occasion insupportable pain to a white man a Negro would almost disregard. I have amputated the legs of many Negroes who have held the upper part of the limb themselves. This is from Julian Lewis's book, uh, The Biology of the Negro. This was uh, republished as recently as 1942, where he writes, they are stoic in their reaction to pain and discomfiture, do not easily go into shock, take anesthesia well, resist infection, and show remarkable powers of recovery. From Dr. A.G. Smith, these people will bear cutting with nearly if not quite as much impunity as dogs or rabbits. Right, so here uh, there's certainly, I think, some amount of dehumanization, obviously, uh, but it's tied to experiences of pain often. And again, I think uh, these beliefs were often championed as ways of uh, justifying the, the harsh treatment uh, of slaves. Now, I want to point out that these claims about biology and race resurface with some frequency and regularity, even in contemporary times. Uh, we've seen pseudoscientific claims of rapid natural selection uh, and selective breeding during slavery being sort of put up as explanations for the prowess of black people and black athletes in particular. Uh, again, let me give you a couple of examples. So this is from uh, Jimmy Snyder, a sports commentator in the late 80s. He uh, said, the black is a better athlete to begin with because he's been bred to be that way. You can read the rest of the quote. Uh, and here even Michael Johnson, who is himself a black athlete, said, all my life I believed I, came, I became an athlete through my own determination, but it's impossible to think that being descended from slave hasn't left an imprint through the generations. Okay, so here says, slavery has benefited sons like me. I believe there's an athletic gene in us. Okay, so again, these, these sort of narratives about race and biology are uh, still very much prevalent. So one thing that's interesting about these beliefs is they're clearly rooted in racist ideology. Um, and then yet, in spite of that, at least in contemporary times, they're not highly correlated with prejudiced beliefs. Uh, so Jennifer Eberhardt and uh, Jennifer Williams have found that, in fact, beliefs that race is biological, not social, uh, is independent from negative racial attitudes. And so here, what we test is whether beliefs about black, white biological differences will predict racial bias and pain perception uh, and in turn pain treatment recommendations. So the first thing we did, we did was just a small pilot study as proof of concept. So we recruited uh, participants, online respondents, uh, and we asked them to answer uh, questions about how much pain they would feel in various scenarios. So we asked them, imagine that this happens to you. I slam my hand in a car door. How much does this hurt on a scale from one to four? One being not very, not no pain at all to four being uh, extreme pain. And then we asked them to consider another person and we randomly assigned them to either consider um, a person who is white or black. And then we asked them those same questions. How much do you think this would hurt this person? Right, so now this person slams their hand in a car door or this person cuts uh, their, their, themselves with a sheet of paper. And then they completed 15, um, 15 items about their beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. So for example, we asked them, from definitely untrue to definitely true, what do you think uh, is the sort of truth value for this item? Blacks age more slowly than whites, or blacks' nerve endings are less sensitive than whites. 
or black people's blood coagulates more quickly. We also had some items uh, like whites have larger brains than blacks, whites have more efficient resp respiratory systems than blacks uh, to look at whether um, sort of these items framed in terms of black superiority or white superiority might matter. And what you find is that people, a non-trivial proportion of people endorse these items. And it's, not, it's not a majority uh, for most of them. Uh, and here we did specify that we didn't mean this metaphorically, right? So I said black skin is thicker than whites, and then we said something about collagen, right? So this is not just, this is not metaphorical. Um, and so you see that people endorse this uh, in non-trivial numbers. We also included some statements that are, I think, more made perhaps sort of descriptive or face value. So things like whites are less susceptible to heart disease, uh, blacks are less likely to contract spinal cord diseases. <coughs> Here we're using this statement, blacks have denser, stronger bones than whites, as a, as a true belief, and I can talk more about that um, in Q&A. Uh, here we're using this as a true belief because there's some, some evidence that blacks may have uh, lower instances of osteoporosis. It's not clear to me that that's what participants are thinking when they're reading this item, but just to be conservative here, we put it in the, in the true beliefs. Uh, and again, uh, people here endorse these beliefs. Uh, again, you'll notice here, even here, it's not it's not a majority of people. And so then the question is, do these beliefs matter? And so here on the y-axis, I've plotted average pain ratings. On the x-axis, you have beliefs. So low beliefs are people who don't believe uh, these, these beliefs to a large extent, and then high beliefs are people who, to some extent, endorse them. And what you find is that for people who don't have these beliefs, who say mostly, no, I think these are untrue, you find no difference in the extent to which they think a black person or a white person would experience pain in these various scenarios. But for people who do have these beliefs, uh, you find that they think that the white person would feel more pain than the black person. Okay. So then, of course, the, the important question here for us is do uh, people with some medical training show this uh, as well? And so here what we do is we recruit uh, first, second, and third year medical students and residents. And we have them do conceptually something very similar. Uh, so instead of just answering questions about would this person feel pain, uh, we have here two medical cases, the kind of cases that medical students might see in medical school. Uh, and they see a case of a black patient and of a white patient uh, suffering from either a kidney stone uh, or bone fracture. And everything is, is randomly sort of um, counterbalance. Everything is counterbalanced. And we ask them, how much pain does this patient feel from zero to 10? And then what would you recommend uh, in terms of treatment? And here we code treatment as either accurate or inaccurate. And this is a little bit tricky uh, to get at accuracy here because pain is a subjective experience. Uh, so what we did here to define accuracy is we asked 10 experienced physicians to read the vignette without race or gender information, and we ask them, what should someone do? Right? What, what should this person be, be given? And overwhelmingly, our, um, our physician said that the, the kidney stones and the bone fracture would require some kind of narcotic. Okay. What am I pointing to here? Uh, so just to give you a sense of what participants saw, this was one of the two uh, cases, so this is the this is the, fraction, the, the fracture case. Uh, and so what we do here to manipulate the race of the patient is, again, very similar to that uh, first study I told you about, is we randomly assigned each case to either have a stereotypically black name or a stereotypically white name. And then just to give you a sense of the treatment recommendations that participants were, were making, right? these are the ones that we coded as accurate. So these are narcotics, opioids, uh, and these would be inaccurate. Uh, now, you, you can do the analyses both ways, uh, but for the, the data I'll be showing you today, people who just left uh, recommendation blank, we just, we didn't count them um, in the data, right? So we could have maybe coded them as saying nothing. Uh, that's not clear. That's what participants were telling us. So here, this is just people who answered that question. Okay. So here again, the results in terms of endorsement of the biological beliefs. Uh, something to know is that uh, as you move from first year to being a resident, they decrease very markedly. <coughs> right? So I think this is one of, this, w one of the good news is here is, is that, that uh, it does decrease with practice. So here are the ones framed as uh, white superiority. 
again, you, you saw, I think, in, if you'll remember, in the first study of this study, it, it's very striking, uh, that these are much less likely to be endorsed at all, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and these are the biological beliefs that we might consider true. Right here, these are much more likely to be, um, to be endorsed. Okay. So then again, same setup. Uh, how are people thinking about the pain of this now black patient or white patient uh, as a function of whether they hold these beliefs or not? Um, and here we see a, a different pattern a bit. So if you look at now the low beliefs, people with low beliefs, so these are people by the most, for the most part who say that these are not true statements. What you see is that they actually think the black patient feels more pain than the white patient. Uh, we didn't predict this. Uh, one of the things we think might be going on here is that actually in clinical context, black patients do uh, report greater pain than white patients on average. And so this could reflect um, something about their lived experience, um, but we're not, we're not sure. But for the high beliefs uh, participants, again, you see that they think the white patient would feel more pain than the black patient. Okay. Now going to... Um, the pain rec or the treatment recommendations. Here on the y-axis, you have percentage of people who are prescribing uh, the narcotic. And here you do see the, the interaction that, as we would have predicted it, that for people who have low beliefs, uh, there's no difference. Uh, given the pain difference that we saw in the first graph, I think this is still a bit uh, perhaps right, um, surprising and perhaps uh, disheartening. Because remember here, those folks are thinking that the black patient feels more pain um, but they're not giving the black patient more pain meds. Um, so there's no difference there. And again, for people who do have these beliefs to some extent or do endorse these, these statements to some extent, you find that um, they would give more pain meds or the, they're more likely to give the narcotics to the white patient than the black patient. And so what we find is that people with and without medical training believe that the black body is fundamentally biologically different from the white body. Um, this isn't really new. Uh, again, Jennifer Eberhardt and her student um, Jennifer Williams have already demonstrated this using a different kind of measure. But what we find here is that these beliefs are associated with racial bias in pain assessment uh, and with uh, treatment recommendations. The silver lining here, I, I think, is that we can teach students about social conceptions of race and challenge biological conceptions of race. Uh, and so our next step is to develop and test an intervention aimed at reducing biological conceptions of race. Uh, it turns out this is, this is challenging and hard, so if you have ideas, uh, talk to me. Um, but I think this step is really important for a couple of reasons. On a practical sort of level, I think it's important because it might reduce um, racial bias in, in treatments. On a theoretical reason, it'll be important because it'll be a stronger test, it'll be a causal test uh, of our claim here that perhaps these uh, biological beliefs matter. And so let me lead you back to where we started. If we agree that, in, that healthcare inequalities are shocking and inhumane, then we have to work to understand them and eliminate them. Our current work suggests that perhaps challenging old notions of racist biology might be a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Our next speaker is Ben Converse, who will move from the healthcare system to the legal system. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to the Watson Institute for uh, hosting us and for you all joining us on this uh, very beautiful afternoon. I don't think it's controversial to say that we're living in an era of unprecedented video coverage. Uh, cameras 
are everywhere. They continue to increase not only in large cities, uh, but also small towns. We're very familiar with uh, police forces across the country uh, already uh, pursuing and in, uh, increasing cases, uh, looking toward on-officer recording devices. Uh, and if there is not a camera on an officer or somewhere on the building, uh, then most of us have a fully functional one in our pockets that comes out uh, as soon as something interesting is happening. I don't know if you uh, saw this recent uh, event, but this was uh, in the news uh, about a woman who made a, a false accusation uh, about someone's uh, young child's uh, intentions in a grocery store. This is a photograph of people taking video of a camera crew filming her watching surveillance footage of herself. Uh, and uh, if that doesn't do it for you, you've probably been filmed uh, at least a couple times on your way here uh, today. This was uh, 10 years ago, I'm, I'm guessing, unless there was a quiet uh, turn back on the number of uh, cameras on this campus that this number uh, has only increased. So it seems that as we go through our daily lives, uh, when we are behaving both at our, our best and at our worst, uh, there's a very good chance uh, that a camera is on us or will quickly be on us. This was the case for uh, somebody who was, in fact, uh, behaving at his very worst. Uh, I'm going to talk to you now about uh, a heinous crime uh, that happened uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so starting in September, there had been uh, a crime spree around Philadelphia. Uh, the man on the bottom there, um, John Lewis, uh, had begun robbing a number of convenience stores and restaurants uh, in increasingly violent ways. Uh, and the Philadelphia Police Department was on high alert as a result of this, and were actually sending uh, patrols out to the kinds of places uh, that he was committing these robberies. Um, Officer Chuck Cassidy uh, was a 25-year veteran of the Philadelphia Police Force. Uh, and happened to come in uh, on this Halloween morning to a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, not knowing that a crime was going on there, uh, but in fact, Lewis uh, was in the middle of uh, a robbery. So the officer came in, uh, pulled his gun, uh, and John Lewis shot him uh, within a couple of seconds. There was no doubt uh, that this was, uh, that he was guilty of murder, uh, and he was convicted of murder uh, relatively shortly thereafter. Uh, the only question, as far as we can tell from our readings of these transcripts, uh, transcripts in this case, was whether the murder was intentional and uh, worthy of first degree, uh, which in Pennsylvania uh, would come along with lethal injection, or if it was somewhat more spontaneous and therefore would warrant a conviction of second degree murder uh, and life in prison. In Pennsylvania, killing is intentional if and only if the actor has an intention to kill, that is, if it is willful, if the actor's mind is fully conscious of its own purpose, that is, if it's deliberate, and if the actor has sufficient time to carry out his purpose, uh, that is, it's premeditated. Uh, and this is uh, the specific language from Pennsylvania, uh, but is, does not differ in, uh, in big ways uh, across most states in the United States. One of the key pieces of evidence, uh, I don't have it, we haven't been able to get it, uh, except for the screenshot that appeared in the news, uh, was the surveillance video uh, of this crime. And the prosecution repeat, repeatedly played uh, this video for the jury, and they repeatedly played it in slow motion, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, many, many times in slow motion. Lewis's uh, lawyers uh, eventually appealed. This uh, went all the way up to the state Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. They were arguing that the slow motion video was biasing and that showed an exaggerated version of events to the jury, that it enhanced and supported the Commonwealth's theory in an unrealistic uh, way. The Supreme Court justices who were trying to reason their way through this posed a number of uh, questions. Uh, first of all, this court should reverse the trial based on the additional three seconds of footage. Uh, this was uh, not a leading question as far as we could read in the context of the transcript. It was really trying to reason through what does this additional three seconds of footage actually mean. Uh, and Justice Eakins uh, asking a similar question, what is it that you can see in this case only in the slower version that you couldn't see in the fast version? Trying to, again, get the reasoning. What was the point of showing this in slow motion uh, over and over again? Of course, uh, for a conviction, what uh, you would need to see is actus reus, what actually happened, that the crime, in fact, uh, was committed, what were the behaviors. Uh, that is considered uh, a point of fact. 
But for intentional action, for premeditation, in this case for first degree murder, what you also need is a mental judgment, some inference about what's going on inside of somebody else's head, something that we never have direct access to. Uh, so what could be seen potentially in slow motion that couldn't be seen at regular speed? Uh, also as a psychologist, I see that as a psychological question, a social cognitive question. Uh, and we would suggest that what could potentially be seen is intention. Uh, this is not a particularly complicated logical or theoretical argument from psychology. You need only two assumptions. The first is that estimates of duration are malleable, that they are subjective. We don't know exactly what three seconds is. Sometimes three seconds feels long. Sometimes it goes by very quickly. Uh, and many incidental factors can push that estimate up or down. So we don't have a great sense of what exactly can happen in three seconds. The second assumption that you need is simply that even when people are aware that something could be biasing, they don't generally adjust enough to totally uh, compensate for that bias. So they might be aware and correct a little bit, uh, but in a host of uh, different kinds of judgments, we see uh, that awareness causes people to undercorrect uh, and not recognize the full potential impact of that incidental feature. So the implication of this is that uh, when somebody is watching uh, a crime or another action in slow motion, because it is slowed down for you, it will feel like it was slowed down for the actor, and it is easier then to imagine the actor forming some intention in his or her mind and therefore seeing it as premeditated. Uh, what we have the luxury to do as social psychologists uh, that the justices didn't have the luxury to do is to run controlled experiments uh, and test this uh, particular question. Uh, so we ran a series uh, of experiments uh, that involved uh, a couple of different uh, videos. I'll show you two of them uh, where, like the case on which this was based, it was unambiguous what happened. The only thing uh, that was up for debate was what was actually going inside uh, the actor's mind at the time. So we assigned people to either see the video at regular speed or in slow motion. Two and a quarter times slower is the typical replay speed uh, that you're probably used to if you've seen things on social media or in sports. Uh, it is also uh, the speed as far as we can tell from the transcripts at which they played uh, the John Lewis footage. We had participants view this three times, uh, and then we asked them to report how much time did it feel like the actor had, just as a subjective uh, measure from a lot to a little. So just did it feel long or did it feel quick? Uh, and then we measured in a continuous way and a dichotomous way uh, whether people saw intention in that action. In this first study that I'll show you, we tried to use the language that was very similar to Pennsylvania, willful, deliberate, and premeditated intent to kill. Uh, the dichotomous measure that I will show you for the first time is with the intention uh, to kill the victim. Uh, I'm going to show you now the, the videos that we actually showed uh, to participants. This is not from the John Lewis case, uh, but this is footage of uh, a real murder uh, that happened outside of a convenience store. Uh, and so I uh, apologize for the graphic footage. We would have told participants we're going to show this to you one time just to get a feel for it. And then we filled in a little bit more information, trying in a space of a, a you know, couple of minutes to give the key pieces of information uh, that they would get if they were in a trial. But of course, there would be much more uh, information going on in the trial. We told them in this case uh, the uh, true detail that uh, the person who was shot, the store clerk, later died as a result uh, of this gunshot wound. And we said, please imagine that you're on the jury. And we gave them some background information. Your job is to determine whether this was uh, appeared to be intentional or not. And then we would have showed that to them again and reminded them of their job and showed it to them uh, one more time. I won't show you the second one. This is, uh, so people either were in that condition, saw it only at regular speed, uh, or they were in the condition where we presented this in slow motion. And the question for them would be, does this look, in their case, more uh, not more intentional, but does this look intentional? Uh, you can see that people in the slow motion con uh, condition reported that it felt like the actor had more time to assess the situation and decide what to do. Uh, that in both the continuous measure and the dichotomous measure, which is on a percentage scale, uh, we're more likely to say that this was an intentional action when they saw it in slow motion. 
This is a uh, relatively small effect. Uh, one way to think about whether this is, uh, or to what degree it might be meaningful in the real world, uh, one thing we did was just a, a simple simulation or basically a binomial probability to say if we drew 12-person juries from the group of people who saw it, in, in our case, only at regular speed, where 77% of people said, yes, this looks like it was intentional, or from the other group where 86% of people said, yes, this seems intentional, what would be the number of juries out of a thousand where before deliberation even begins, the jury goes into the room unanimously agreeing uh, that this was in fact intentional. It's still a low number uh, that would be unanimous at the beginning, uh, but that would be 39 juries at the right, if you drew from uh, what was in our world, the regular speed condition and 150 juries uh, in the slow motion condition. So a small effect uh, that can accumulate pretty quickly. Uh, if we're making life or death decisions on this, uh, then it would seem to be something that we ought to be paying attention to. Uh, I'll just show you um, that we replicated this in a few different contexts. One of the things we were wondering about is whether there's something so jarring about seeing an actual video of uh, a crime like that uh, or whether it would replicate in a more mundane setting. Uh, so this is the version that sports fans are uh, very familiar with. Uh, and by the way, this is the paper that sports fans already knew and didn't need uh, a bunch of science uh, to show. They, they truly believe, uh, yes, of course, in slow motion, it always looks worse. Uh, so yes, it is legal to hit somebody in a football game, uh, but it is illegal to uh, hit that person helmet to helmet. And so the question was, uh, did this look more intentional uh, in slow motion? And again, we see a similar pattern of results where it feels like the person had more time uh, to assess the situation and therefore uh, that seemed like a more intentional action. Now one of the uh, pieces of uh, debate that came up or points of debate that came up uh, regarding the appeal uh, uh, based on slow motion in the Lewis trial was that there was in fact a timestamp on this uh, video the whole time so jurors could in fact see yes it transpired in slow motion but there was a clock ticking off showing that it's just one, two, three seconds, so shouldn't they be able to uh, correct for that uh, and not be biased uh, as a result? Uh, the time that transpired was uh, displayed on the tape and repeatedly uh, pointed out to the jury, so this seems, again, like a clear empirical question uh, that we can ask. So we just uh, essentially replicated the first study that I showed you, but we added two new conditions. So you either see this in slow motion or regular speed, and you do it the same way we did it the first time, or like uh, the jurors in that case, uh, it was repeatedly pointed out uh, that only three seconds elapsed between the time when uh, the defendant grabbed the store clerk's arm, backed up, and then fired uh, the weapon. And you can see that people accurately took in this information. When we told them it was only three seconds and we said, how many seconds did that take? Both conditions said it took about three seconds. Uh, if they didn't have that information in the original condition, uh, then that three seconds felt like uh, about five seconds. When we said, how long does that feel? You see a bit of that pattern starting to stretch back, but there is still uh, probably um, Arguably a difference between those two conditions, but in general, uh, that slow motion feels a little bit slower. They're not statistically different when we remind them versus not, uh, but they are probably at some very small level meaningfully different. When it comes to uh, intention, however, we continue to see more slow motion, whether we reminded them uh, that there was three seconds or not. Uh, more intention in the slow motion than the regular speed condition, uh, including in this case where we actually uh, changed that dichotomous measure and said, should we find this person guilty of first degree murder or second degree murder? Uh, they were more likely to say first degree uh, in the slow motion condition. Another argument that came up was that the jurors in the original case saw both things. So we have these very controlled experiments. We show them only one or the other. Uh, jurors will see uh, a mix of both. What does that look like empirically? It looks like what you would expect. It's somewhere in the middle when we take out all other information. It seems to close this down a little bit in our very sterile environment, uh, but not all the way. These are not the cleanest effects. Uh, we ran many, many studies to try to figure out uh, is there still a difference between regular speed uh, and both speeds? Uh, and the best answer that we can give you based on our data is that yes, there is a very small uh, but pretty reliable effect between those two things. So both speeds seems a little bit better uh, than only slow motion, uh, which would be somewhat reassuring. Uh, at the same time, 
there's also a lot of other things going on in a trial and how all of those things uh, interact we really couldn't say uh, from those particular studies. Uh, so what I think we know at this point is that slow motion can increase perceived intent uh, simply because if it feels to me like the person had more time, then it is easier for me to put the kind of intention uh, in their head that I would need to see to call it intentional. Bias does not seem to be eliminated, uh, at least in these paradigms, with this particular set of action uh, by making the actual amount of elapsed time uh, salient or uh, make it accessible to people's minds. Bias seems to be reduced uh, but not completely eliminated by showing the video at both speeds. Of course, there are infinite numbers of combinations of how many regular speeds, how many slows. If you show it over and over again, does it start to feel slower? If we show it at regular speed to kind of say, hey, we showed it to them at regular speed, and then we show it 20 times in slow motion, all of these combinations, uh, I think, are still up for debate. So I think uh, we can be proud to say that we have a, a bucket of knowledge from a sea of ignorance in this case. Uh, we don't know exactly when slow motion uh, seems to increase perceived intent, but we know that it can, uh, and I think it's important to know that it can. Uh, I would consider this an existence proof of potential bias uh, and a call to action that if we're going to make life or death uh, decisions based on this, that we understand what it's actually doing. We also don't know if this is making people more accurate. We have no idea what was going on inside the minds of any of the people uh, in our studies. Uh, we only know that viewers thought it was more intentional systematically in this case. We are in the process of uh, doing our best to uh, sort out the accuracy question. Uh, one context that we've thought of to potentially do this is uh, with baseball uh, beanings. This is where the pitcher throws the ball uh, at a batter. If we isolate that context, there are many situations where people, you know, baseball experts will almost unanimously agree there's no way he hit that guy on purpose, or yes, he definitely hit that guy on purpose. We could pull those out so that viewers don't know the context context and see, does the bias persist, but what does that do to accuracy? Are they actually more likely to get it right? Uh, once again, an empirical question and an important one. In general, what the court had to weigh was whether this slow motion was more probative than prejudicial. prejudicial. At a public policy school, I would say, or an institute of public policy, I would say, uh, that the question is a, a benefit cost analysis. Slowing things down can give us a better idea of what's actually going on. Sometimes that might even make things seem less intentional. If I slow things down so you see something you didn't see, then maybe I have changed the intention, but that would now be a case of actus reus, what actually happened. If it's purely about uh, intentionality, uh, we've not encountered a case or can't think of one where without exposing something else at slow motion uh, where we would expect the opposite. Uh, but again, an empirical question. In a sense, all slow motion and freeze frame video distorts reality. The justices recognized this when they were considering the Jordan case. Uh, such distortion may enhance the jury's understanding or it may do uh, the opposite. So I hope uh, our work will point to the fact uh, that it can in fact uh, do the opposite, that it can in fact, uh, or here we don't know if it's the opposite in terms of accuracy, but at least push them and, and therefore uh, have this prejudice uh, that may overweigh uh, the probative value. Um, just as a reminder of why I think a call to action is important in this case and a call for further research, uh, this is a separate trial that was also arguing about uh, the prejudicial value of slow motion video. Uh, and the problem here was that the videotape was shown to the jury at regular speed only primarily because neither the prosecutor nor the bailiff knew how to operate the tape player uh, at a slower speed. The jury, the jurors asked later when they were in deliberation to uh, view the video once again. The judge knew how to use slow motion on the video cassette player uh, and played it in slow motion for them. And so the appeal in this case uh, was that they had a different experience across the two and that perhaps the judge uh, had biased it this way. There are cameras every everywhere that leads to a desire to use that information. I would say that as far as we can tell, we are psychologists trying to understand the legal system, but it seems like the wild, wild west. We have no idea how video is being used. There don't seem to be uh, any rules about how it's being used. When we published our first paper on this topic, uh, a number of legal teams reached out to see if we would be willing to help them make a case that slow motion should or shouldn't be used in their situation. And all we can say, I think as good scientists, is we don't know. We can tell you what happened uh, in these videos, uh, and it seems to be uh, a bias in that direction. So thank you very much. Appreciate that.
now our discussant, Joachim Kruger. Hey, Ben. Do you know how to use, did you find your PowerPoint? Because he has one as well. Thank you very much. Great. Um, this is um, really creative and important work, and I'm delighted that I was invited to comment on it. And uh, so I prepared some remarks. I have less time, 10 minutes total, and I saw the two papers, the two critical papers that are on which the two talks are uh, based. And I already see now in the presentations that some of my questions have already been answered. <laughs> so bear with me. There will be a little bit of redundancy. Um, I've been at Brown for a while. I study bias and error. I knew a few things about intentionality because one of my colleagues here is an expert on it. He was mentioned <coughs> Mahler. He's at Brown. Um, and to summarize what I will say, what I, the, the one line summary of my position is that it's um, important to conceptually distinguish between bias and accuracy, which you recognize. Um, they are conceptually independent, uh, and that's often misunderstood. So I'm, I'm, I worry that your paper may be misread by some people. They would say, oh, there's bias, and therefore something is wrong, there's inaccuracy. Uh, but there are cases where bias, a preference, a tendency, uh, uh, leaning in one direction, uh, can increase accuracy. That is possible. So let's see what we have here. Um, intentionality, that's an octopus. And it turns out uh, the octopus can open this jar. It's a twist topic. It twists the lid and get at the crab inside. So it has a lot of the properties that we observe in behavior that wants us to attribute intentionality. But um, uh, can we? Is there a gold state? How can we simulate the octopus's mind? And as we've seen, what we, get, what we have here are the problems of mentalizing, theory of mind, getting into the mind of a person who's experiencing pain, or um, a juror, or a, a, a defendant. So, uh, and we, we ought to have some biases. Here's a bias that's built into the, the legal system, I believe, in the Anglo-American system. Uh, you can find it in Aristotle. This is a German legal scholar who was very worried about the witchcraft trials at the time, Friedrich B. von Langenfeld. And at the time, they wrote in Latin, and we have this maxim, which is a bias, in dubio pro reo. When in doubt, find in favor of the defendant. Intention, crime, and punishment, that's my essay on my blog that you can find where I say more about that. So you've seen this before. This is the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania who um, said that the trial court's decision that slow motion was more probative than prejudicial. Oh, I think that's a quote from your paper, not from the Supreme Court. <laughs> so uh, probative, that's legalese, but you have the smell of accuracy. Right? Prejudicial is biased and inaccurate, but probative is there's more information, better information, and you have more accurate judgment. <laughs> But is that the case? Um, can we translate this legalese concept of probativeness into uh, our lay and, and psychology jargon of accuracy? In attributions of intentionality, is it the case that uh, more is better? A stronger um, inference of intentionality was present in that other acting person. Uh, does that mean we now have a better judgment when we move in that direction? What do we mean by intention and intentionality? There are subtle distinctions, but we don't have to worry about that. What we want is something willful, deliberate, premeditated. I think you had the exact same three words, and um, I think they're from uh, Bala's um, uh, theory. So a human, maybe an octopus, a human is doing something, and we judge that it was willful, deliberate, and premeditated. And how the hell do we know? How do we get into the mind of that person? And the silver standard that we have is a self-report. We ask the person. And of course, that's of little value in a legal context where there are all kinds of incentives not to tell the truth. The truth, if you intentionally murdered somebody, well, you have an incentive not to admit that. And then you get into this slow motion 
Um, and you ask, um, are we getting better judgments here? And this is a summary of your simulation. I translate that into probabilities. You get a threefold. You're still low, but a threefold increase in the probability of having unanimously convicting a uh, jury on hand. But the true probability of intention being there or not is unknown, and maybe it's unknowable, the accuracy of decisions. Um, there is no possible inference from bias to inaccuracy other than that at least one of the two conviction rates must be false. They can both be true, but they can, they can both be false. So intentionality, how do we assess it? Um, the actor needs to be motivated, there needs to be a desire to achieve a certain outcome. And again, how do we creep into the mind? Uh, there needs to be foreknowledge, so the acting person needs to know what will happen if a certain act is executed. If I point the gun and shoot, I will know before I do it that the result will be that you will be injured or dead. And there's the issue of control, there's also belief that one can perform that action. I do have a gun, I know to operate, and I can bend my finger in this way. Now, uh, one, two, and three must be obtained, or can be, on a good day, obtained from the target self-report, but they could be lying. Uh, we can simulate uh, in our own mind and then take that as a judgment of what is likely to be the case for the other person. So what if I were there, what I would do, would I have the desire, would I be able to predict, would I be able to control? If all the answers to these questions are yes, then I attribute that to the other person. But that's a heuristic hypothesis and prediction that may be, that may be false. Or we have other cues available from the context that we can put together as a configuration, a gestalt, that point to intentionality as opposed to something else. And that's why when you think of prototypical instances of intentional behavior, you think of something else, not the kinds of clips that you get on surveillance cameras where things happen so fast, but a premeditated murder, wouldn't it be nice to have a a suspect where we have evidence that planning had been going on for months and weeks and days and a, a diary written notes and the, the gun was purchased and all this, then we have a clear pattern from which you can infer uh, intentionality and our job is easy. So here, but in, in these cases, we're moving into this critical territory where we don't have that. We have footage and can footage make up for what we don't have which is the diary or the confession that's the question and so in these footages we don't have that we can't even infer it but we may be getting a window to better have a better understanding of the person whether the person wanted had a desire to achieve the outcome that's the, the uh, goal I think so any attribution of intentionality is an influence from theory of mind. Accuracy is indeterminate, um, but uh, the only proxies in terms of coherence of cues are the, and the agreement among the, judgment, the judges. So ultimately, if you do have a jury where all agree, then it's actually taken as a factual uh, endpoint that justice has been served and, and the, the unanimous judgment of a jury turns into our proxy of that must have been true. Now, which desires might be, might uh, slow more reveal? I was intrigued. I didn't, I read the paper, of course, I couldn't, um, I couldn't, uh, I didn't see the footage. So the first one was particularly, it, by the way, it's bad, right? It's grainy, it's, the lighting isn't good. And the first one, you saw this person from behind. There was a hood and all this good stuff that you want to see, it's a facial expression, wouldn't that be revealing? You don't have. There, was, there were a number of things in the motion, like the, the person shot and then I think he moved back and shot again, and that, that could give you an idea, pointing to intentionality. But I want to get into a different possibility here, that isn't it possible that when you do get facial expressions captured on footage, and then it's slowed down, you might see some very interesting things, and they may go in the opposite direction, away from, oh, look how intentional the person was, but holy smokes, uh, look at these micro uh, expressions that you see all of a sudden. And 
So what we have here, <laughs> thanks to David Kabuti, who is right here, who noticed this. So how, what do I do to start this? How do, what do I do to start the, I don't see the. It's embedded, mind you, to the mouse, and yeah. All right, so watch Melania, at regular speed and then in slow-mo. And I hope we have sound. We don't have sound. Can we get sound, please? I asked before about audio. They intentionally. <laughs> they wanted to mess it up for me. Now you prove me wrong. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> do you know how to do it? I used to love it. Oh, thank you for your help. Do you love your husband? Yes, we are fine. Yes. <laughs> it's what the media speculate and it's gossip. It's. No slow mo. Yes, we are fine. Yes. Okay, so the, the history of this is that I've um, um, been teaching a class and we got into this, we found this uh, paper on pottering. And pottering is a form of deception that does not involve lying. So outright lying, it's a sin of commission. You turn, you tell a falsehood. Then you can lie by omission, you fail to point something out to tell something that you should have told and you don't, that's deceptive. And then pottering is cool and uh, it's worrisome because it might be paltered. Here you have somebody who tells the truth but is not answering the question. And by answering a different question affirmatively, uh, making a claim, a positive claim, misleads you to draw inferences that end up uh, in your disfavor. And I saw this late at night, I was watching and there was Melania. Melania came up and thought, gee, uh, she might be paltering in her answer to the question, do you still, well, still, isn't that a rhetorical question, do you still love your husband, assuming that she did at some point, <laughs> she said, yes, we are fine. And I thought, this may be pondering if, um, if it's a comma. Because if it's a comma, yes, comma, we are fine, then the yes affirms that we are fine. If it's yes, full stop, we are fine, then you could say the yes affirms the question. And it's not pondering. She might be lying, but it wouldn't be pottering. And then David, who is right here, um, said, but let's look at her facial expression. Let's slow it down. And then, uh, maybe you saw it. It's, it's subtle, but you can see it, that as what you expect it to do, you get a question, direct question, and you don't break eye contact. You ask me, are you happy? And I say, no. And it looks straight at you. What she does, her eyes move ever so slightly to the left. Her eyelids come down. Her head rotates so it went over and comes back. It's as if she non-consciously is trying to buy time. See, I lapse into intentional language, but this is very fast. These are micro-expressions. They are not controllable. And what you might see is not some kind of clarity, oh, the person is here or over there, but no, what you learn is there's a mental struggle going on between different parts of the mind with different levels of consciousness. So, and there is no clear answer. There are some possibilities that she might have thought, oh my God, I can't believe he's asking me this question. Or, oh my God, I despise my husband, but I can't say it on TV. <laughs> or, well, yes, I love him, and how do I best put it? No. We don't know, but this conflict, what, what, we, what slow motion reveals is uh, the subtle stuff, the micro expressions, and not necessarily uh, a clear flag for um, intention in one direction or another. So that's my comment on that paper. And now uh, for the other um, pain. So pain is notoriously difficult to assess and talk about and get right in terms of accuracy. When pain is what you have, it's excruciating, unpleasant, but it's a qualia type of thing. Nobody can feel it with you, really. Uh, and therefore, perhaps Shylock had to point it out and say to Antonio, 
if you prick us with a pen, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? So he's making a claim of similarity to the point of equality. We're all the same kinds of humans, built in the same way. We respond in the same way to pain. There should not be a bias or an inaccuracy. But by the way, that was not really Shylock's point. This was just a rhetorical lead-in to the real claim that he wanted to make is, we have learned from you. We are the same as you. When you Christians are wronged, you take revenge. And we are the same as you are, so we do the same. Hence, I want my pound of flesh. So um, I wrote a blog post on that paper. And uh, maybe it was late at night. I called it African pain. And the editor was changed it. That was just, and I, OK, fine. I get that. Don't. So now we have this more academic title for the essay. And so I took some notes on your paper as well. <coughs> so here we have some of the foundations where we start. Black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans. I think, again, it's a quote from your paper and not something that you had quoted. OK. And this racial bias is related to false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. <coughs> blacks, uh, one item was black people's skin is thicker than white people's skin. So here, um, my impression was there's a bit of a loaded um, uh, uh, phrasing going on because undertreated and um, relative to white Americans sets white Americans up as a standard from which any departure is something negative, biased, inaccurate. And that may be done, but if all the evidence for that is clear. Otherwise, it's a presupposition that's easy to make. Here, the second, the racial bias is related to false beliefs. That is something that I want to question just a little bit, um, as we shall see. So here's the list of your items that are copied directly out of the paper, the black ones the bold face ones are the false beliefs, and the non bolded or accurate beliefs, as far as we know. Uh, and there is a mix in both for the false and the true beliefs of biological difference. There are some items favoring whites and some favoring uh, blacks. It's just about half and half. So valence is controlled. <laughs> And uh, you, you saw this. Um, here you have average pain rating for the black targets and the white targets. And uh, here, down here you have people who, uh, who don't see differences, so who don't endorse uh, the false beliefs or endorse a lot of them. This is one standard deviation below from the, in the distribution, that's one standard deviation above. And you see the difference among the higher believers, the higher endorsers of false beliefs. Uh, and, and this is the signal that uh, among those high endorsers of false beliefs of biological difference, the black target is judged to experience less pain for the same type of vignette presented, like getting your finger slammed in a car door. Um, and. Uh, but it could be this. This could be in over. If we consider accuracy, if we could, if we had an accurate uh, benchmark, and it could be the judgment made f for the whites. You, you might say, can I? Uh, I don't recall. Maybe this was different. This was statistically significant, statistically significant and the, <coughs> am I pointing? I don't see it. Yeah. yeah. So the ideal pattern would have been that these three points are the same and that only this is below. So the, these data are a little more ambiguous. And here, um, again, the action seems to be in the uh, uh, judgments made about white targets between the low believers and the high believers. But um, this is supposed to be the signal, but it's as you noted, harder to interpret, because again, what do we make of this? Um, and then this I should skip, because I now learned my criticism is um, not, um, uh, would not be well taken. So in the end, what we have is we have a possibility, given the data, blacks are undertreated, whites are accurately treated, 
or blacks are treated accurately and whites are over-treated, which is also something you point out in the paper, we do have uh, a crisis of opioids and overuse, over-prescription. I think the medical profession is scaling back a little bit, but 10 years ago, it was a very liberal uh, prescriptions for Vicodin and, uh, and, and whatnot. So both of these are possible. And um, my central point of the study, I have to say, there is a piece missing in the analysis, and I think you have the data to look into it, um, because it's possible, at least, that what the subjects who are here analyzed as the high endorsers of false beliefs, it may just be people who endorse beliefs of biological difference, including the true ones. So it may, but it may just be people who are ready, who have a bias to agree with statements. It could be acquiescence, but that could be easily solved, I think, by analyzing the data separately um, for people who endorse uh, the true beliefs of the false beliefs. So in theory, it will be interesting to see uh, if the problem lies specifically with those who have a bias to endorse false beliefs and fail to endorse the true beliefs, but that would remain to be seen. So in conjunction, what we might have is one and three being true, or one and four, or two and three, and two and four, but some of this can be uh, disambiguated. So what we take home, um, to judge any, make any judgment of accuracy, we need an external criterion both in intentionality judgments or pain judgments. Uh, bias and accuracy are ind conceptually independent. Bias sometimes increases accuracy and utility, as in when you avoid probability matching. If you don't know what that is, if you have a gambling machine that pays out, there's a green light and a red light, and it pays out uh, uh, a win if, uh, the green light comes on 80% um, of the time, you should always bet on that 100% and not just 80% of the time, which is what a lot of people do. And finally, there is, it's, I understand the temptation uh, when um, uh, group differences and perceptions of group differences are assessed that a default bias or what the some in the humanities called an othering is going on, that uh, you set up one group um, as a standard, you study differences, and you see there is a difference for the other group, then you judge that departure as telling, but it might be the case that the other group, or the smaller group, the minority, is just in the right place, and it's the larger group, or what you think is the standard, which is displaced. So that needs to be made clear. And again, where's Eric? Thank you very much Great. for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. So, um, I invite the panelists to come back, and we're going to open it up in a minute. But before I do, I want to see if Sophie or Ben had any quick responses to Joachim's thoughtful commentary. Please do. Um, can I, uh, yeah, I, I need to think about some of what you said a little bit more. Um, but just a couple of thoughts. Uh, so the first with accuracy, I, I mean, I agree. Uh, and with pain, it is, it is difficult, right? It is, I mean, it is partly a psychological <coughs> subjective experience. And so sort of thinking about accuracy in this domain is really hard. Yeah, I, it's true that there are times when people are over-prescribed right, or over-treated for pain. That's undeniable. I mean, it's not, we, we know this now, right, to be a, a phenomenon. At least in this study, I mean, you can have both, right? So you can have a situation where black patients are undertreated and white patients are overtreated, right? Both things could be happening. They're both problematic for different reasons. I think in our study, you know, we, we asked 10 experienced physicians whether what kind of treatment should be used in this case. And you know, nine out of 10 of the physicians said narcotics, right? And so, so we use that as accuracy. And so I, you know, I think what we see is that actually both white and black patients in our vignettes were undertreated, under and that black patients were undertreated more. Um, it's consistent with that study about can cancer pain, where again, you see undertreatment for both black and white patients. You just see it more for black patients. Um, in other situations though, right, I mean, yes, right, in other situations that's not the kidney stone or the bone fracture, there, there might be situations where 
the racial difference is about white over treatment. Um, I, I don't think that's what we capture here. The third variable thing is really interesting. Um, yeah, so you know, th this is a correlational study uh, where we just we measured some stuff, right? And we saw how they, they correlated together. Um, and so there is a potential for a third variable that would both lead to sort of endorsement of these items um, and racial bias. Uh, I told, I get how gullibility could sort of track with uh, endorsement of the beliefs, right? You like see this belief, if you're not sure, right? You might have a sort of sense to say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe, yeah, that seems reasonable. Um, I'm. I'm not sure, this is where I need to think more, I'm not sure that I would predict that gullibility would lead to more bias to, in pain perception. Um, but yeah, but I, I need to think more about that. Uh, and then the, I had one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, we, so we, so we, we ran so many analyses on these data uh, for reviewers. Uh, and, and so a couple of things about the true versus false. So we, we do one analysis where we look at false beliefs predicting pain controlling for the true ones, which I think is sort of similar to what you suggested, and the false beliefs predict and the true don't. So that's the easier answer. I think the harder one is that uh, we've also gotten some folks saying, you know, your true beliefs aren't actually true either, right? Because race is not biological, uh, then what you're capturing, I mean, even the descriptively it's sort of true, what the, the true statement would be people who experience discrimination in this country, that means people of color uh, experience these health disparities. Uh, and so some have argued that what we really ought to do is create a single composite with all the measures, right? Because these biological differences, um, race is not biological, right? It gets biologized, and so we should use all of them. Um, and so that's, <coughs> that's tricky, <laughs> and we're still wrapping our head around that and how to, how to think about that. But, but, yeah, but yes, yeah. Um, it, that, the, the false beliefs are the ones that seem to be tracking. And I think that's in part because the true beliefs just have less variance. I mean, they're, they're, they still have some, but just less. Um, Great. Uh, but yeah, the gullibility thing, I, I need to, I'll think about. Ben, any quick responses? I've preempted, preemptively yielded my time to my colleague. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have um, uh, about 15 minutes uh, before wine and cheese reception that I hope you all join us for in the corridor and like to open it up for your questions, I'm sure. Um, people have reactions. Yes, in the back, ma'am. Mine is easy. Uh, so in our studies, we uh, gender match participant and the person they're judging to take gender off the table. Uh, and so we, I can't answer that question based on our data. Jamie Dreckman, who did the study with the NCAA um, medical staff, and, and I helped him think through it and so on the paper, but he really led the study and, and collected the data. Uh, and he did not gender match, and so we can look at gender there. I believe the gender effects were very small. Uh, there's somebody else, uh, I can't remember her first name, Wadner and her colleagues at Florida, um, they've looked at gender effects and found what you suggest, that men are stereotyped as being tougher and sort of less you know, uh, sensitive to pain. Um, in the student athlete study, we did not find, if I remember correctly, large gender effects, but I think that's also a very specific population, right? These are student athletes, they're super fit, they're super tough, right? They play these like tough sports. And so I think maybe our context was just not a really good one to think about gender. Yeah, but I, I 
what you say sounds right. What you say sounds right to me also. Uh, <laughs> We, so I, sh I share your hypothesis, I share your interest in the idea that uh, repeated exposure uh, might show similar effects. Uh, we haven't tested that, uh, but it is uh, a hunch that, that could be worth some uh, more studies. What we did test, however, uh, was whether the uh, raw exposure, the objective amount of time uh, that, over which a particular action unfolded could explain away the effects that we were seeing. So uh, I left it out of this talk, um, but there was a study, uh, actually it was uh, the second study with the football videos. There is a third <coughs> condition in that study um, that I didn't think people would be interested in uh, this Friday afternoon, but I was wrong, uh, where we inserted a pause in the middle uh, so that the regular speed was exactly this, regular speed with a pause was exactly the uh, same time as the slow motion video, which is I think the best that we could do or that we've done so far, and um, and that doesn't close down the whole effect. Uh, more generally, I think it, you know it's interesting to think about what other things would could stretch out a perception of time because we used video, but it could, uh, and I've talked to litigators about this. Uh, they know about this effect too. They stretch things out by, you know, you can say he walked in the door, he pulled a gun and he shot it, or he opened the door, he made eye contact, he took two <coughs> steps, he pulled that, you know, so you could stretch time out in, in a lot of different ways, and I think you would get similar effects. Great. I have a question. In your study, you uh, basically uh, segregated the patient between uh, white American and uh, African American. But did you also look at how an African American doctor would prescribe differently to a white patient or a black patient? And same thing with uh, yeah. And we have a less we have less data in general, right? right. Like those kinds of yeah. Uh, we do have actually a good sample of non-white participants in our medical school sample. They're not black, right now. So some of them are, but but that's not the majority of those genes. So we can't do analysis just on them. Uh, what I can tell you though is that when we look at non-white participants in that study separately, they look different. Um, they actually don't look different so much in their uh, endorsement of biological beliefs, um, but they just don't show the same biases. And so, I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you we've talked with a lot of them. Um, that many of them are motivated to be in med school because they want to work on disparities, right? So there's this sort of added motivation that's not there for some of our white students. And I don't know how much that matters or how it matters and how it can mitigate this bias. And so that's another piece of the puzzle that we just don't have a lot of. Right. And, and, and the other question is, is all the sampling done in one medical institution or is it like a, a, a hospital in a, in a black community versus uh, it was predominant it was it was in multiple sites technically but mostly from one okay. yeah. great other questions yeah it's a, i guess were these actual case studies or theoretical they were theoretical <laughs> case studies i mean they were based on case studies they see in medical school so they're they're plausible and you know they're, they're something they might see uh, but it wasn't based on that So state and studies, yeah, so state and studies did that, and they find both that uh, black patients report more pain on average, uh, and that doctors, when they're asked on that same scale, how much pain did your patient feel, are more likely to underestimate black patients' pain. So they discount what yeah. patients report. And I feel like I should be more careful because, right, it's, it's, assuming, every, it's mm. assuming the patients have a sort of objective metric on their pain, and maybe accuracy is here is tricky. But yeah, it's, yeah, there are those differences. Other questions? Yes. I have a question with regards to certain uh, stereotypical biases. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> um, sorry whoa. for not mentioning that. Um, sorry. I'm going to do it without the microphone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So um, my question is, you mentioned that stereotypically basketball is a more uh, a sport that is associated with African Americans. Soccer is associated with white Americans. Uh, there are certain Which is strange. stereotypically uh, yeah. uh, African American names, stereotypically white names. I'm not for, from America. Uh, my accumulation for the stereotype mechanisms in my mind are completely different than an American's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, you didn't mention, but I'm assuming that your subjects were all American or mostly, have, mostly yeah. lived not, in America. Not how, what kind of empirical data did you have with regards to these associations that you took as kind of like mm -hmm. 
basis of your arguments and um, when when doing those uh, how did you try to take out the biases of subjective experiences such as I had I, there were a few names uh, that you had put up that I had never seen in my life yeah. before with no stereotypical bias I had. <coughs> right. What kind of an adjustment did you do? What kind of demographic uh, variation did you have in yeah. your? So we, we don't have enough to test the extent to which this is a cultural phenomenon. I have every expectation that it is. I'm, I'm French, my parents are very, very French. I had my parents do an implicit association test once where they had to sort names that were stereotypically black and white and with positive and negative words. They showed no bias, they were so pleased with themselves. They didn't know those names, right? They didn't know what was stereotypically black or white. They couldn't do the test. Uh, so I, I, I trust that this is a culturally bounded phenomenon, but we haven't done this cross-culturally to know that that's the case. Um, I mean, the thing about the names, too, is that they, I think, denote not only race, but class, and we do find that people have um, pretty strong stereotypes about class and pain, right, where I think in America it's very common for people to hold the sort of ideology that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that no pain, no gain, right? We, there's something about hard experiences <coughs> that creates toughness, and so I think and we have another paper on this where we show that that's at least a big, that's part of this, right? And so again, I think there are, there are these cultural narratives that clearly matter. We haven't tested those empirically to show that outside of the cultural context, you don't get them, but I would be shocked if that weren't true. Yeah, I would be really surprised. I was told to walk around with a bike, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, think that's You might not have any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a couple. Yeah, Neil. Uh, <laughs> they told me to do So one thing that I was wondering is, <laughs> in regards to this issue about accuracy, uh, whether it's yeah. possible to use something like a well-defined diagnostic procedure, where we have a, you know, a notion of like what the costs and benefits are for a particular case, we use that as sort of a benchmark so we can potentially assess whether uh, there are actually deviating, you know, these biases are correcting some existing uh, mistake away from the correct or accurate benchmark. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. I think one of the things you might expect just based on psychology research is that uh, it's when things are not super clear that you see the most bias, right? As soon as there's a clearly right answer, right, then bias is greatly reduced. Sometimes it's eliminated completely, right? And so Jack video has these really nice studies where he shows that you know, when the best applicant is unambiguously a black person, people will hire the black person, right? And if the black person is unambiguously bad, like, they will just never hire him. It's when you have a black applicant and a white applicant, and they're both, like, mm, sort of good, right, that you see the most racial bias in the employment context, for example. So in, in this context, right, I think, yeah, if there are very clear guidelines, right, that would be great, because I think we would actually see a lot less bias. Um, and so that actually might be a solution to the bias and not a great way to really illuminate the bias. Yeah. <laughs> I go ahead and start. <laughs> You're making my job hard. <laughs> the data that you showed with regard to how racial bias decreases with, uh, from medical students to yeah. residents, any theories on how that occurs? Is it just more time spent with direct patient care? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we don't, you know, we, we've talked a lot with the students. I mean, one of the things that we had to do in order to collect the data is to do really extensive debriefing with them. So we did these hour-long sessions with all of our participants uh, just after the study. And so, I mean, one thing that happens is, especially first and second years, this is sort of hypothetical for them, right? First years don't see patients, second years do, but they're still just getting the hang of it. And so I, I think there is something about practice that is really humbling, right? Where you realize that these people are in a lot of pain and I think it really sort of wears on you. So I, I don't know how that is shifting beliefs. Uh, it's, what doesn't seem to be happening is that they're getting explicit training on this, right? Um, I, mean, I think many medical schools, to the extent they talk about race and racial bias, it's about like bedside manner, right? It's about how do you talk cross-culturally to your patient. When they talk about race in the classroom, it's about just disparities and so just descriptive stuff, right? It's not about sort of challenging these notions. And so, I, the, I mean, the answer is I don't know, and, and now I'm just rambling, but um, <laughs> but it's clear that the experience 
mean something to them. And one of the things that we see is that, um, actually contrary to I think what a lot of people believe where they think more experience means that you're sort of getting hardened and like you just don't recognize your patient's pain, we actually find if anything a slight increase across the years where people, the pain ratings actually go up just on average. Um, and so I mean, they're just, they are really getting sensitive to their patients, to this potential patient's pain, um, which I and a second question, how does this, how do you impact public policy with this information in terms of how implicit bias affects decision making, which is really the backbone of public policy? Yeah, so this has been really challenging. I mean, the truth is that we've been wanting to do an intervention study um, since, since before we even published this, and logistically it's just been really challenging, right? I mean, med schools aren't like jumping up and down for us to come and show bias in their institutions and then try to reduce it. When they know that you know the intervention, whatever we come up with, is probably not going to work, right? Because most interventions, I think, of this kind just don't work or are not tested, and we don't think they work. Um, but you know, we're thinking very carefully with Norm Oliver, who uh, was at the U UVA Medical School and is on on this project and is now the Virginia um, Health Commissioner. Uh, like we're thinking about what we can do in terms of guidelines. And I, I think your you know your comment about now, could there be clear guidelines, right? Because then, then once we know what accuracy looks like, we can really push people towards that, and then they, they don't have to make the subjective judgment, right? There's sort of a protocol. Yeah, I think that's probably very useful in this case, um, but we're just not there, and we, we have a lot more work to do, and it's just, it's gonna be hard logistically just to do it. Yeah. Any other questions? If Brown Medical School wants to do this. <laughs> Anyone else on the panel want to add anything? Nope. Okay, well, if not, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the panel.